this weekend at the MGM Grand Garden Arena, where it all started for AW five years ago with the inaugural Double or Nothings. And we know a lot of you were with us in Vegas back in 2019. We were grateful for your interest and passion then. Every bit is honored to have you with us today. So thank you. And we're going to get going here in a minute. First, a couple quick notes. We have about an hour or so and a, quite a lineup of you interested in some of Tony's time. So to be courteous to your fellow journalists, no two-parted questions, please. And second, your effort to keep today's press conference focused on double or nothing is certainly appreciated. So here we go. I'm going to turn it over to Tony now for some opening thoughts, and then we're going to open lines for your questions. Tony. Thank you, Jim. Hey, everybody. Uh, really excited to be here today to talk about five years of AEW and the anniversary of Double or Nothing and the big pay-per-view this Sunday. Uh, the show is going to be available on a lot of different pay-per-view providers, the most we've ever had, including Bleacher Report, Triller TV, YouTube, all the cable satellite providers. Uh, we've added DAZN as a pay-per-view provider now for Double or Nothing. And uh, a lot of great ways to get this show. And everybody in AEW is really excited about our five-year anniversary show on Sunday. Uh, when I get to the questions, and make sure I get as many of you uh, able to ask questions as possible. And if you don't get a chance to ask something today, hopefully we'll get everybody's questions after Double or Nothing on Sunday. Uh, Jim, please take it away, sir. All right, let's go, Tony. Your first, uh, your first uh, up will be Jim Barcelone from the Miami Herald, and following Jim will be Mike McGuire from Vista Radio's. I really don't enjoy going first because then I got to ask the question. <laughs> I got to ask this question. <laughs> I want to ask about double or nothing. Why are you guys doing this? <laughs> All right, so I'll try to tie it in this way. What is it like having a W double or nothing? And a big event like that is signature event. To help start it all. I'm not making a two part. I'm making a one part. But how does it help if it does with just getting more eyes on it, getting TV negotiations going, maybe other interests from different TV entities, streaming, et cetera? How does AEW Double or Nothing help something like that if it does? Thank you. Yeah, well, absolutely. It's a great question. We have a huge, huge uh, following here in AEW, and it all started with the original Double or Nothing event. And this is going to be a great show. Uh, we've had great success on pay-per-view this year and uh, with our pay-per-view ticket sales and, and our pay-per-view event sales on cable, satellite, and streaming. Uh, expect this to be another great event. Uh, right now, I think we're two for two this year in 2024. I felt like uh, Revolution and Dynasty have been two of our great pay-per-views. And this is an amazing card for Double or Nothing on Sunday. And uh, having a big, big event like this uh, puts us in a really, really good position. I think it gets a lot of eyeballs on the product and also uh, a lot of attention from media and all of you giving it great coverage. Uh, and I think, you know, it's a really important year for AEW. It's not only our fifth year, but uh, we're also going into renewals for most of our media rights. And it's going to be... Uh, a major, major year. We'll have a lot to celebrate uh, because we're going to see huge growth in our revenues this year uh, as we renew those deals. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Mike McGuire from Vista Radio's McGuire on Wrestling is next, and I'm going to follow Mike with a write-in from Jonathan Hood of Good Karma Wrestling in Chicago. Mike. Is Mike there, Jim? I am not Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, there he is. Yeah, got you oh, now. There we go. We got you, Mike. Sorry about that. The pop-ups were coming up in different ways here. Uh, Tony, thanks for the time today. Congratulations on five years. Uh, definitely a great accomplishment for you there. It's been an interesting five years for fans watching. And one of the things, of course, when you have a company going as strong as you do and as often as you do, is the, the plague of injuries. And there's definitely been some big names that have been out for injury uh, for a while now. Um, when, when you have a, a case like this, where you have some definitely top names that are, are coming down, are you kind of trying to put things with storylines and, and with your characters in a holding pattern, or are you looking at this as a chance to try and build new talents? And I know you said there's no two part questions, but I also just wanted to know, do, do you need a permit to own a flamethrower? I'm just curious, but anyway, that's all I got. Thanks. Uh, I, I do think you need to, uh, 
you know, you, you do. Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure whether you need a permit uh, to to fire one off, but I'm glad that uh, Darby had one, and I'm glad he was able to use it. Uh, and uh, that was great to see the flamethrower on AEW Dynamite last night. Uh, it was, a, it was a great show. I thought I was really happy with the go home show, and uh, that was one element I really liked about it. Uh, so then, uh, to to go back to what you were asking before, um, you you had uh, you got me so excited talking about the flamethrower in your non two part two part question. Uh, going back to uh, uh, what you had uh, let off with, um, you know we have had a lot of uh, injuries. It's been great to get Darby back and. Uh, we're always pushing forward. Uh, we do 52 weeks a year in pro wrestling. There's no time off. And this has been a great year so far, like I was saying. I mean, the first two pay-per-views were huge home runs with Revolution and Dynasty and really looking to keep a hot streak going on pay-per-view with Double or Nothing. And uh, I think for us going into this show, uh, the card looks really strong. It's great going back to Las Vegas same place where we began five years ago at the MGM Grand, and we've accomplished so much in five years, and it'll be really great to go back with such a strong card. And uh, despite the fact some of our top stars are injured, that does create opportunities uh, for them to come back and create great moments. And the people that are keeping us strong week to week right now, uh, they're going to have great opponents walking through the door soon as more and more of our injured stars come back and we've got great matches lined up now and there's only going to be more and more great matches that are possible as we get some of those injured top stars back soon. Thanks for asking. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> so, Tony, I've got a write-in from Jonathan Hood from Good Karma Wrestling in Chicago. I'm going to read it in a mm -hmm. second. I want Dominic D'Angelo from Ad Free Shows to be ready after Tony answers Jonathan who asks if there are some other cities out there right now that you're looking at to showcase AW for television programming that you haven't been to yet? That's a great question. Yes, uh, there are some cities that we've never been to that I've, I've brought up uh, in the U.S. and in Canada and overseas. I think there are some great cities that would uh, be great homes for AEW Dynamite and Collision and Rampage, as well as our pay-per-view events. Uh, we're doing some different things in terms of, uh, you know, uh, routing and touring and it, it creating some new opportunities for us to have stuff like the AEW Summer Series on the path to All In in Arlington, Texas. That's a great opportunity for us and working with uh, the local government and the city to plan a series of great events in a great market like that. And then there are other markets that we, you know, have not mined and not been to. Uh, and I think there are some excellent places in the U.S., Canada, and overseas where we have not been yet, where uh, there's a great opportunity, where there's following for AEW and a potential for us to draw. Uh, it's been great having Koshe Irby come in and join us as the COO, putting a great live events team together. And uh, that's something we're talking about all the time is new markets where we can bring AEW. You know, the show's on in 150 countries around the world now. We've got great penetration. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities uh, internationally as well as domestically to open up new markets. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Jonathan. Dominic D'Angelo from Ad Free Shows is next. Dominic will be followed by Andrew Vidala from the Final Bell Media. Dominic. Hey, Tony, can you hear me okay? Yeah, hear you great. Cool. Uh, Tony, uh, looking forward to the pay-per-view this weekend. First year, I'm not able to make a double or nothing, so pretty bummed about that. You guys did a great build for uh, for the show on Dynamite last night, I thought. Uh, wanted to follow up. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. Wanted to follow up with uh, one of the legacy talents that have been in the news lately, uh, Mark Henry. Uh, a report came out that his uh, contract was expiring this month, supposedly. And was curious if you had interest in re-signing him or what his status is with the company moving forward. Uh, I really like Mark. Uh, you know, we have to look at that internally, but I think uh, as far as the contract and dates, but I think Mark's a great person and uh, I really personally like him. Uh, you know, he's uh, 
a great media personality as well as being a great wrestler and a great philanthropist. And uh, I have a ton of respect for Mark and uh, he's been great in AEW and uh, I have a lot of respect for him in and out of the ring. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you, Dominic. Andrew Vidala from Final Bell Media is next. And I'm gonna follow Andrew with a write-in from Kimmy Sokol of the Pop Break. Andrew. Hey, Drew. In the summer series at the Esports Stadium in Arlington, Texas, could this be a new norm for AW Collision and other TV to give it a unique feel with the venues? And would you explore more intimate venues with a residency in the near future? Well, it's interesting. The city of Arlington gave us a great opportunity there and uh, favorable terms, and it's a great market for pro wrestling, and it's a great venue, the Esports Stadium in Arlington. So... I think for us, that was a unique situation. If there are more opportunities in great markets with great venues uh, and cities that really want to bring AEW in, then any time that's all lined up, I definitely think there would be a lot of interest on our part in working with that kind of a situation. So it's something to keep an eye on for our shows. I do think it's a, a unique opportunity for the collision path to all in and an opportunity to differentiate between the two hour packages of dynamite and collision for AEW. And uh, I think that having some of the most passionate, loudest, most loyal wrestling fans on the entire planet around the Dallas Metroplex area and the great fans in Arlington makes a lot of sense for us. And it can really help us build up, those shows at such an important time of the year for us where that run of collision episodes will be going on the path to all in at Wembley stadium. So uh, I definitely think if this goes really well and we're expecting it to go really well, that it, it could be a model for other future series like this. Thanks for the great question. Thank you, Drew. Thank you very much, Andrew. Tony, I've got a write in here from Kimmy Sokol from the Pop Break, and Amy Nemedy from WrestleJoy will follow your answer to Kimmy, who asks After Serena Deeb's serious metal condition last year, it was unsure if she would be able to return to the ring. Now she's not only returning, but facing off against St- Tony Storm. What do you make of her comeback and the match this weekend? Well, it's a really, really inspirational story to see Serena Deeb return to the ring. Uh, She went through challenges outside of the ring that she talked about, and she had some medical obstacles to get through to make her return to get this match with Tony Storm. I think it's amazing what Serena has achieved, and it's going to be a great world championship match when she takes on Timeless Tony Storm this Sunday at Double or Nothing. Serena Deeb has been involved in some of the very best matches, and I expect uh, that this will be another great match. Time with Tony Storm, the great champion, the very different styles of fighting uh, with Serena and Tony, very different presentations between the two of them, but I have a ton of respect for both wrestlers. Uh, I think Tony Storm's a great champion, and Serena Deeb's a great challenger, and absolutely Serena Deeb has been through a lot to get to this point in her career. And uh, she's an inspiration to a lot of people. And I think it's great that she's been able to get back in the ring. And I'm really looking forward to that world championship match on Sunday in Las Vegas at Double or Nothing. Thank you very much, Kimmy. Amy Nemedy from WrestleJoy is next. Amy will be followed by Bill Pritchard from WrestleZone. Amy. Hi, Tony. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Amy. Hi. So first, congratulations on celebrating five years of AEW. I'm really excited about the TBS championship match at Double or Nothing this year. And I think when we talk about the history of AEW, we also look at making history with this match. So we have Willow Nightingale, Mercedes Monet. They have, of course, a lot of history between them, with Willow becoming the inaugural New Japan Women's Strong Champion when Mercedes was injured during that match. We've had the rise of Willow Nightingale. We've seen her become TBS champion. For Mercedes, this will be her first match since last year and her first AEW match. 
for someone at like Mercedes, known as a history maker, making her debut where history was made five years ago with Double or Nothing, can you talk about the stakes for both of these women as well as their preparation heading into this match? Thank you so much. Yes, great questions. Uh, well, it's been tremendous uh, building up this CBS championship match uh, between Willow Nightingale, the champion, and the challenger, Mercedes Monet, who will be making her debut in AEW on Sunday. Mercedes Monet is one of the biggest stars in all of wrestling. She's been a great champion all over the world, and I think she's very deserving of an opportunity to come into AEW and challenge for this. Uh, and Willow Nightingale has been a fighting champion, fighting open challenges uh, recently in Japan and defending her title in a street fight. She's uh, going to be now taking on one of the greatest wrestlers in the world this Sunday at Double or Nothing. And there's a lot of history between Willow and Mercedes, as you alluded to. Uh, their, first, their previous match was over a year ago. It was actually one year ago this week. So in addition to this week being the five-year anniversary of AEW, it also represents one year since their prior match and one year since Mercedes has stepped into a wrestling ring. And it's one of the biggest names, uh, one of the most charismatic stars, and one of the most recognizable faces in the sport coming back to the ring after a major injury and a major upset loss. Frankly, when Willow won the New Japan Strong Championship at Mercedes Monet's expense. I don't think anybody was expecting that. I don't know if Mercedes Monet was expecting that or had Willow for her. That was a big upset. And I think that she may have been the only one, you know, that, that, that believed that might happen. And, uh, you know, but, but in all seriousness, I do think um, that Willow Nightingale and Mercedes Monet have the potential to be a great rivalry this match is an important chapter, and I would not be surprised if they were to step in the ring again someday because uh, there is already, I can see, a lot of chemistry between these two. I believe that this match is really important to both of them. It's a great opportunity for Willow to prove what we've seen over the past year when she won the New Japan Strong Championship, when she won the Owen Hart Foundation Cup, and now the TBS title. Time after time, Willow has stacked up these accomplishments. And this past year has been the greatest year of Willow's wrestling career. And it's no coincidence that it started at the expense of Mercedes Monet. It's really been a tale of two wrestlers. One who's been out stacking up championships, wins, and really building up their career. And then you have one of the biggest names in the whole sport who has not been able to step into a ring in a full year. And when they get, finally do get in the ring and when all that history uh, comes together and pays off, I think it's going to be a great match. I'm really excited about it. And I think it's a great opportunity for both women, for uh, Mercedes Monet, the challenger, and Willow Nightingale, the champion. And the winner of the match will be the face of TBS, but the Superstation, a network with 50 years of history in the pro wrestling business. And It'll be uh, a very fitting prize for the winner of a great match and a huge part of this triple main event on the five-year anniversary show of AEW. Thank you for asking. Thank you, Amy. Bill Pritchard from WrestleZone, you are next. Mark Oak from 101.5 FM Don will follow hey, Bill. Bill, you're up. How you doing? Great. Thanks, man. How are you? Uh, I'm, I'm doing good. Uh, this is going back a little bit, but uh, I wanted to ask about your thought process on being a, a character on TV. I know originally you said, you know, you were reluctant to do it. You were known as the matchmaker because there's, you, that's a necessary element. Uh, but now we've seen you in recent weeks and I'm including the stuff with, you know, you appearing on the, the NFL draft uh, as part of it, but you've been more of a character in this sort of internal power struggle. And I just wanted to know, uh, you know, who or what sort of made you change your mind about being on TV more, if anything, because it's been effective, it's been well received, but I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, the various appearances you've made in the past 
couple of weeks, including, you know, last night driving Darby into the arena with the truck. Sure. Sure. Uh, well, I appreciate that. Thanks for saying it's been well received. I, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, and I've really tried to limit the amount of appearances uh, that I personally have made over the past five years. Uh, I think it would be fair to say that less than one tenth of one percent of the television time has been spent on me over the last five years. And that's how it should be. And uh, occasionally, like you said, if a match needed to be made or a major announcement, you know, I would come out and do those things. Uh, I am planning to, uh, uh, you know, visit the fans again uh, this weekend. And, and uh, you know, I love being at the events before and after with a live crowd and visiting with the fans, signing autographs and, and taking photos and things like that whenever I can. And it's... Uh, it's really important to me that the, the, the focus of the show is on the wrestlers and the wrestling. And I think even when there's a story like the struggle for the control of the company, uh, you know, the, the power in the office, I think it's still important to feature it in the context of the wrestling show and with the wrestlers. So even in a thing last night, you know, I think I it was maybe for like at most two seconds on the show. And that's how it should be. You don't need to see a ton of me. Uh, it should be about the wrestlers and the reaction Darby got when he got into the arena. And because the Young Bucks had banned him from the arena and Kenny Omega has been out with the surgery, then there's really only one person that could lift that ban. And I felt like that ban really needed to get lifted. And it was really important going into Double or Nothing for the fans to see Darby and for him to go in and save Brian Danielson on his birthday. And uh, and for Brian and Darby to stand tall. And FTR have been a great part of AEW as well. I think this is a really cool team, AEW. It uh, originally included Eddie Kingston, but when Eddie was injured in New Japan Pro Wrestling, uh, and we're all wishing him the best and hoping Eddie gets well soon. We love Eddie very much, and we want to see him well and back. Uh, but the, the team changed, and the circumstance changed when Eddie got hurt. And... An interesting aspect of this team AEW is I think that you have, uh, and again, you asked about me appearing on the show and I'm trying to talk about the folks on team AEW and not talk, but I think it was important to get, uh, you know, Darby into the arena and I can't wait for FTR to rejoin Brian and Darby on Sunday at double or nothing. I think it's really cool that this team AEW represents four really key people in the locker room and also four people uh, that came in really during what I see as almost the three different eras of AEW, you know, that pre pandemic, uh, really even pre Daily's place before we'd even been to Daily's place. Darby is truly an original, uh, from the original shows before the original fight for the fallen in 2019 and, and before dynamite. And so you have, uh, a, an original in Darby Allen and then, you know, FTR who are Daily's place pandemic era, uh, classic uh, part of that run. And they were there through pretty much almost the entire daily play pandemic. They did a, a full year with us uh, and they were with us when we went back on the road and, you know, having Darby from that pre daily place, pre pandemic era, FTR from that daily place pandemic era. And then Brian Danielson, who really exemplifies what it was when we, got out back on the road and the possibilities and the excitement. And I think has embodied AEW as much as anybody for the last few years, Brian Danielson. And then uh, to have those four together, Darby Allen with Dax and cash FTR and Brian Danielson, that's a great team to me. And uh, you know, it was important. Darby was there uh, to back up Brian last night. And I felt like uh, there was only one person that could get him in there. Uh, but again, I think it was also important that, you know, at most, maybe two seconds of that would be me and, and the rest is him because uh, it's important to showcase the wrestlers on the wrestling show. Thanks for asking. Thank you, Bill. Mark Hoke from 101.5 KDON is next. Mark will be followed by Harry Ruiz from Raider Nation Radio 920 AM. Hi, Tony. Good to talk to you again, sir. How are you? I'm doing great, man. How are you? Uh, doing well. Welcome back to Las Vegas, sir. Hey, thank you very much. 
very much. Thanks for having me. <laughs> well, I, I can't say I rolled out the carpet for you, but I, I think you did that yourself. But um, of course, professional wrestling is obviously becoming super massive here in Las Vegas, and you were ahead of the curve on that. Uh, but one question I have been getting a lot from people is the choice to play at the MGM Garden instead of T-Mobile this year. And I was wondering if you'd be able to address that. What went into the decision uh, to go at the uh, MGM instead of T-Mobile this time around? Well, one thing that really meant a lot to me was looking back at the sentimentality of the five-year anniversary. And, you know, when we came out here, uh, originally, we ran MGM Grand Garden Arena. We've had some great events there. And we've gone to T-Mobile Arena. We've had some great events there. And I think T-Mobile is a great arena, a great venue. Uh, I think MGM Grand represents the very beginning of AEW. It's where we launched, and it's where this whole thing began. So for the feeling of the event and Going back to where we all began, I thought it was cool to go back to where it truly all started five years ago. And uh, it's going to be really neat, I think, for us to go back there. It'll be a really sentimental memory for a lot of people that were there at the beginning and a lot of people that, that were not to go back and look at how much the company has changed in five years. And, uh, you know, that, that's really a big driver of the decision, Mark. And I think uh, it'll be a great event, and I'm excited to be back in Las Vegas. As you said, five years ago, uh, we brought Double or Nothing here to Las Vegas and really, I think, had set off a, a series of great, great events. The original Double or Nothing set the record for the fastest sellout in the history of Las Vegas Pro Wrestling. It's really cool. And uh, we've got a great thing going here, and I love coming to Las Vegas with the wrestlers. I know the wrestlers enjoy it and the fans. And it's a great destination. I think we're going to see uh, a lot of fans having a great time this weekend and make some new fans out here as well. And that's something we all enjoy. Thank you, Mark. Harry Ruiz from Raider Nation Radio, 920 AM, is next, followed by Liam Crowley from comicbook.com. Uh, comic Harry? A media call this year you're coming out to vegas for uh wrestling this month and then later in the year also for football so uh welcome back into town uh i got a question about your new signings las vegas will be the first aw pay-per-view with all three of your big 2024 signings in action okada osprey and mercedes how satisfied are you with what they've brought to the table and how your shows have produced since their arrivals thank you what a, that's a great question i'm really excited about that uh to have Will Ospreay wrestling for the international title, Kazuchika Okada fighting in the anarchy in the arena, and uh, Mercedes Monet challenging for the TBS title all on the same show. It's really exciting, and I think that for the company, uh, these three have come in at a great time, and this is the first time they've ever been on a card together. I think we're going to continue to grow and, and build, and I think we'll be in a much better place as a result of the three of those great free agents arriving here, I have a lot of respect for each of them individually and collectively. I think they add a lot to AEW and uh, it's going to be great to finally have all three of them on the same pay-per-view. Thanks for asking. Thank you very much, Harry. Liam Crowley from comicbook.com is next, followed by a write-in question from John Powell of Slam Wrestling. Liam. And for taking the time today, stoked for Double or Nothing this weekend. Uh, Darby Allen recently gave an interview where he was talking about uh, him getting cleared for this match. Uh, obviously, he's still pretty banged up with his foot and his nose. Uh, but I was just curious, uh, in uh, the uh, instance where Darby wasn't able to get clearance to compete in this match, uh, and the fact that Eddie Kingston is currently out of action with his leg injury, uh, were there any other names that were circulated to fill that fourth spot for AEW? And considering Darby was the one who reached out to you about filling that match, uh, did any talent from the roster reach out to you about wanting to be that fourth guy and, and represent the company? Well, the Darby thing was a, a case of great minds think alike. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with him, and we are 
complete opposite ends of sometimes I think of, of, of a very similar brain and arrive at a lot of the same thoughts very differently. I think our thought, our interests, and uh, outside of pro wrestling and the way we spend our time is very differently. Uh, one thing we have in common is we're both up late at night a lot, though, and that's when we probably do 90% of our talking. And uh, I reached out to him one night, and I think uh, like he has so often and vice versa, I think he read my mind. I texted him to ask, I <laughs> said, Hey, how are you doing? How's it going with uh, the injury rehab? And he responded immediately. <laughs> I'm doing, I'm doing good. I can fill in and substitute for Eddie Kingston as the partner on Team AEW and Anarchy in the Arena, if you'd like. <laughs> so I think he knew what I was thinking. <laughs> but before I asked the question, he answered it. Um, there were uh, a lot of people that wanted to step up and be a part of team AEW and there were a lot of names I think that would have been great. And there are a lot of people that could have stepped into this role and done excellent with it. I think that for, uh, AEW, I think, you know, looking at where we were last week and for the, for this match and taking everything into account, I think Darby Allen was the perfect choice. But I also think there's a lot of people that would have been excellent in the spot if Darby had not been able to get cleared. And and if he had not gotten cleared, I would not have pushed him in there, even if he had wanted to, uh, which I think he would have wanted to. Even if he had not gotten cleared, frankly, uh, I wouldn't have been able to do it. But uh, it was really cool how he wanted to step up. And uh, before I even got the question out, he answered it. I thought that was neat. Uh, So thanks for asking. I appreciate it, Lee. Thank you, Liam. Tony, here's a write-in question from John Powell, and we'll follow John's question with Stephanie Chase of Digital Spy. John's question is, is, is a simple one. I think you'll enjoy it. What does Double or Nothing's anniversary mean to you and, a, to, you and to AEW? Well, that is a great question. It means a lot. It's crazy to think back five years ago and when we finished the event it was such a great feeling because we knew we were starting something special in wrestling and it was true we had uh it was only the beginning of a great journey and now five years later i still think it's the beginning of a great journey it's the we're you know five years into it uh but five years into a mission of unknown length hopefully infinite, but definitely going to be a long time. And it still, in a way, feels like we're close to the beginning of a long journey, but we've come so far and done so many great things. When we had the original Double or Nothing, I had a dream, and I think all of us had a dream in AEW that someday we would run a major stadium event and build it up, and we did that. And I'm really proud of that and what we were able to accomplish there. Uh, And I think that we continue to do great things. And we've set a lot of milestones in pro wrestling for a company that didn't even exist five years ago. And week in, week out, putting on great TV. When we did the first Double or Nothing, there was no AEW television yet. There was an agreement to launch Dynamite in October of that year. And now we're about, you know, four and a half years into dynamite and it's just been this amazing run. But when we started, we were looking forward to doing TV two hours a week on TNT and it's grown so much. And now we do five hours a week on TNT and TBS. We're doing more than double the weekly content. We've, expanded our partnerships all over the world. The shows are on in over 150 countries now. Our first year, we did three pay-per-views in three quarters with a plan to do quarterly events. Uh, We've successfully expanded the calendar now this year where we've got nine events on the calendar after eight last year. And, you know, the eight last year was a massive, massive success. Uh, And I think it's really, really amazing what we've done over the these five years. Thanks for the great question. Thank you very much, John. 
Stephanie Chase from Digital Spy is next. Stephanie will be followed by Samantha Shipman from the Daily DDT. Stephanie. Hey, Stephanie. Hey, um, so AW has made the decision to move all out to a week later, leaving more time between it and all in. Uh, can you tell us how you came to the decision and any lessons you learned from running back to back pay per views last year? Sure. Uh, it was really a great two week period last year, you know, back to back weekends with all in and all out. There was a lot of feedback. Hey, what about more time between the shows? And they're both holiday weekends. And I think there's a utility to both the weekends. Um, we had run on Labor Day uh, for, you know, several consecutive years, even going back to before AEW All In, which was, uh, you know, really a show run by the elite and funded by ROH. And uh, with those elements, you know, in 2018, Labor Day weekend, I mean, we you know, going from 2018 through 2023, there had been uh, a lot of great events there for All Out, you know, with, the, with 2020 uh, being the exception in Jacksonville. Labor Day weekend has been really kind around Chicago to AEW. I want to continue putting AEW on in September, and I wanted to give the fans in Chicago a great show, and I was thinking, how can I give them an even better show? And I know some of the feedback had said, you know, you, this, was a, this has always been a great weekend, Labor Day weekend for AEW. Coming off the stadium show, it's hard to come in and, and do anything the week after that. But last year we did it, and the show was fantastic. And a lot of people thought All Out was the best event of the entire year. A lot of people also thought All In was the best event of the entire year. And a lot of people thought that uh, uh, that Revolution was the best event of the year. And a lot of people thought that uh, Forbidden Door was the best event of the year. So we had uh, a really, really strong calendar of pay-per-views, I felt like, last year. Maybe our strongest ever, probably. And one note people had was, hey, if All Out had been a, you know, a little bit further out, we could have built things a little bit more, and maybe people wouldn't have been so surprised how great the show was when it turned out to be maybe the best of all of them. And I thought that made sense. Um, you know, other people have done rep major wrestling events within – the same week or even the same weekend, back-to-back -back days even. And uh, it's a different platform for delivery when you're doing shows on streaming and they're all in a bundle and you get them all versus selling events a la carte. I think that's a different challenge. Um, so uh, I think that made a lot of sense. Also, when we started doing Labor Day weekend, we were the only ones running on Labor Day weekend for years. And then... Uh, you know, there was competition moved into Labor Day weekend, I believe it was last year, uh, international competition. And it was like, okay, that's cool. Um, and again, there was a show scheduled for that weekend this year. Uh, and it just seemed like the win, 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 where it was like, hey, we have the ability to uh, take this major event at Wembley, continue the tradition of early September wrestling pay-per-view for AEW around Chicago land go back to uh, another arena where things really kicked off and, and uh, an important milestone for AEW at that now arena around Hoffman Estates, Illinois, and you're all my friends in Schaumburg and uh, all my college roommates and neighbors. Um, and I think uh, it's, you know, it's been very, very well received. People seem to think it was a good move. And uh, I really do like listening to the fan feedback. And this was one of those cases where most of it was really positively received. Uh, with that being NFL opening weekend, it's going to be a busy one for a lot of people, including me. Uh, and I think that it, it made sense for that then to, to put the pay-per-view on uh, Saturday and uh, do a, start the Saturday pay-per-view cycle a little earlier because once NFL season starts, our pay-per-views tend to shift from mostly from being on Sundays to Saturdays. So that's kind of the thought process of the event getting pushed back to six days. Thanks for the great question. Thank you, Stephanie. All right, we're in the stretch run here. We've got time for two or three more. Uh, Samantha Shipman from the Daily DDT is next. We'll follow Samantha with Dave Meltzer from the Wrestling Observer. Samantha? Hello, can you hear me? Hey, yep, we got you. Hey. Good. Uh, first of all, congratulations on five years of AEW and of 
uh, double or nothing. And so I have a question about the what was um, what what led to your decision to run a uh, from what we've heard a triple main event this weekend and um, when do you think we will see the women main event on their own on a pay per view? It's a great questions. I think. Uh, well, I felt like these are three matches that were uniquely positioned on the shows that all have really important stakes for different reasons. I think Swerve Strickland uh, is a great, great champion for AEW, and he has uh, really done very well for us since winning the championship. He's been involved in some major segments, had a great first defense of the title against Claudio Castagnoli on a really important episode of TV that was very prominently positioned after NBA playoffs on TNT. And then uh, we've got Christian Cage, who has been, in my opinion, an MVP of AEW television over the past year. And what Christian Cage has done for the company it is uh, unbelievable. And I absolutely believe that was what we were going to get when we signed him. And I think it's been proven right that Christian Cage is one of the best signings we've ever made in AEW. And that all the hype around his signing was very justified because he's one of the greatest wrestlers in the world and he's done the best work of his career in AEW. And now he's challenging Swerve Strickland for that AEW World Championship. It's a huge match. It's Swerve's first ever defense of the championship on a pay-per-view and and it may be his only defense of the AEW world championship on pay-per-view because the man he's wrestling is one of the all-time greats and i think it's a really interesting match and the rivalry that they built up on television has been captivating they had history going back to last year they were partners at wembley stadium and uh their partnership was ill-fated and now uh they are on a collision course for double or nothing, and I'm so excited about Swerve Strickland versus Christian Cage for the world championship at double or nothing, and I think that uh, that rivalry has heated up and just gotten very personal, and there are great professional wrestlers, both of them, but it's also become a personal rivalry. Christian Cage loves bringing people's families into these situations and playing those mind games, and Swerve Strickland, also a master of the mind game, and I thought it was an amazing segment last night uh, when they uh, went out into the parking lot and they were fighting uh, on the hood of a car. It was just crazy stuff. They're balling on the wagon here. I love to see it. And uh, I uh, really, really have so much respect for both of those men. I think that's going to be a great match uh, in the triple main event. I think that Willow Nightingale and Mercedes Monet is going to be a fantastic match. I gave a very long answer about that match, and uh, I will repeat some of that now. I, uh, but I, uh, I, I think uh, it's important to look back that it's been a year uh, since Mercedes Monet last stepped into a pro wrestling ring, and uh, that Mercedes Monet is one of the most recognizable, most charismatic, most talented wrestlers in the world. And was one of the biggest free agent signings in the history of AEW. And I think that when you look at uh, the matchup between Mercedes Monet and Willow Nightingale, it's important to look at what's happened over the past year. Willow Nightingale has been one of the hottest wrestlers in the world. She's won the New Japan Strong Championship one year ago this week at the expense of Mercedes Monet. She went on to win the Owen Hart Foundation Cup Tournament. She won the TBS Championship. She's the face of the Superstation, the network with the longest, most prestigious history in the pro wrestling business of any television channel, and she's the face of that station. And to be uh, the champion and have people gunning for you, that's one thing, but then to have somebody gunning for you and have that person be one of the best wrestlers in the world and they haven't been able to wrestle for a full year and every single day they've woken up and they blame you for that. And uh, and it's, a, it's just a tremendous situation. And I 
been really looking forward to the match and promoting the match on pay-per-view for a long time and also looking forward to a rematch after the way that their match ended in New Japan a year ago. And I think it's going to be tremendous, and I think that's going to be a great match. And also we have the Anarchy in the Arena, which is going to be really crazy. The last couple of years, I think the Anarchy in the Arena match has been one of the best wrestling matches in the world, yet uh, it has been at various points, not really wrestling. It's been street fighting, brawling, uh, and pure anarchy uh, as advertised. So I think that these matches all present uh, a great uh, utility, great uh, opportunity, and great main event feel for the fans. And uh, I think there are other great matches on the card, too. That our main event worthy, absolutely. I mean, you got so many great things on this card, top to bottom. Uh, these are three that were earmarked for the triple main event. I think there are other matches that would live up to that. Uh, I love the slot machine, the three wheel slot machine uh, in the triple main event, and we we thought that would be a really fun uh, part of the promotional push for Double or Nothing, and I think it is. Seeing all those big stars and big faces, uh, homegrown stars like. Darby Allen and Willow Nightingale and uh, great champions uh, like Swerve Strickland or even, frankly, uh, Okada and the Young Bucks, despite our differences. And then some of the biggest faces and biggest names in wrestling, you see these veteran names like Brian Danielson, Mercedes Monet, Christian Cage, FTR, people that have built these reputations uh, in pro wrestling. And uh, I think that it's a really exciting triple main event and all the men and women in it are very important to AEW. And, uh, that's why I think it's, uh, great for the card and, uh, whatever the most important, uh, opera, you know, whatever, I think whatever, uh, these big pay-per-views come up when you have something like this, it's our five year anniversary show. It's one of our most important events of the year. You know, it's great to have such an important, series of matches headlining the show and uh, in the past the championship matches and the anarchy in the arena have been really a featured part last year we did a double main event with the world title match and the anarchy in the arena as the final matches and i thought that this year uh with the introduction of one of the greatest free agents in the world mercedes monet and her very intense rivalry with willow nightingale that is heated up I thought that this would be uh, a great match to add and make it a triple main event. So uh, that was the thought process. Thanks for asking. Thank you very much, Samantha. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna finish up here. We got two to go. Dave Meltzer from Wrestling Observer is next, and we will complete our time today with Tony with John Alba from Triller TV. We got about five minutes. Dave, you're up. Hello. Hey, yeah. Yes. Hey, Dave. I can hear you, Dave. Okay, great, great, great. Tony, hey, so, yeah, like this being the fifth anniversary, I guess, like, one of the questions that I have is, like, when you look back on the five years, um, what would be, like, the most valuable lessons that you've learned, maybe your biggest surprises, and with hindsight, is there anything that you would do differently with the experience that you have now, and you would look back and go, I wish I could have changed that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we all... Yes, I think there are a lot of things like that, and I think we all learn every day, and, uh, you know, I think there's been a lot of uh, great opportunities and moments. Um, there are countless things that I, if I could have the ability to go back and change time, I would do, and not only in AEW, but in football and in life. There are so many things where I look back, and I think all of us, right? I feel like if any of us had the ability to reverse time, we could do everything. <laughs> and and uh, you know, it's a it's a corny expression. Hindsight is twenty twenty, but it's true. But at the same time, I know that I have spent a lot of time learning and trying to uh, soak up wrestling history. Long before we launched AEW, I learned and and studied wrestling history. Uh, because it was important to me uh, to study things that had happened and try to learn from them, basically. And I, I, there are a number of things that, if in all walks of my life, 
that if I could uh, reverse and, and do some things different, I would. But at the same time, I'm very, very happy with all of it. And um, we are, to some extent, the sum of the opportunities we're given and choices we make. And I've been fortunate to get a lot of great opportunities and, and tried to make the best choices I could. And I'm very happy with where we've ended up with all of it. There's things, you know, when you make as many decisions as I do as a decision maker, there's countless decisions that you could do over and look at how they would have, uh, how they would have turned out. And I, and I think all you can do from those is then try to do something different in the future. But sometimes those opportunities are once in a lifetime and they don't come up, come up again. So you just have to wait and see if you ever get a chance like that again or the next time you get an opportunity that even resembles that, that you do uh, the right thing. You learn from what happened in the past. So in this business, you make so many swings a week, and I think you learn from the pitches you swing at, and uh, you've got to keep swinging and taking shots. And, uh, you know, Jack Nicklaus uh said you miss 100% of the putts, you don't get to the hole. You know, I think it was like a Michael Jordan, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Um, I always like the Jack Nicklaus one a lot because it's a good golf. <laughs> you know, it's true. Like, you don't, you don't get it to the hole, you're never going to make it. So um, uh, it's a little bit, it's not, it's not, it's a similar expression, but it's not the exact same expression. It does have a little bit of extra oomph to it. And um, I, you know, it's a great question. I, I'm sitting here like thinking about it and giving examples and I don't want to bury anybody or, or the company, you know, it's just, there's so many things in life. Uh, you know, I think about, you know, looking back in the NFL, if everybody could undo the NFL draft, all 32 teams would uh, do some things differently year in, year out, if they had the benefit of hindsight. So in sports, you know, it's good to think that way. So you can learn from the things you do, but you can't also spend, your whole life wishing you could go backwards because we're all really fortunate to be able to spend every day doing these things. I mean, pretty much everybody on this call I gather gets to do some things that really love with their work. Um, even if this isn't for all of you, your full-time job and you're doing other things, you're covering wrestling. And I, I gather you're doing it because you love it and we all love it. And uh, I try to look forward and, you know, we're all really blessed to be doing this and, you know, I think we can all spend a lot of time looking back at pro wrestling history and learning from it, and even recent wrestling history and learning from it. But, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun that we get to do this every day. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Dave. As promised, we're going to get you in, John Alba. You're, you're going to um, uh, bring us home here. Uh, John Alba from Triller TV. You got a few seconds here. Once you fire away, and Tony, give, give John your best. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. Tony, congrats on five years. Pretty crazy. Uh, remember that first press conference in Jacksonville. Uh, amazing to see where we are now. So congrats on that. Uh, but turning the page from the past to the present and the future, uh, how does the state of the NBA's future with Warner Brothers Discovery affect AEW's media rights negotiations? And would that maybe encourage you to explore other potential bidders outside of the exclusive negotiation window when that closes? Where do things stand there? Oh, well, I definitely won't talk to anybody before the, before the window. <laughs> and, uh, we're, you know, and I'm very happy with being at Warner Brothers Discovery. Um, they've been so great to us. And we've been able to find a home at TBS and TNT. And it's very fitting that AEW has been able to find a home with the networks that have been the home to professional wrestling for so many decades. And the tradition of pro wrestling on TBS and TNT, it fits like a pair of gloves. And I love being here. We've watched the company change a lot. And now we're under the management of David Zasloff, who has been great to me. And I'm really blessed to work for him. And he's given us more opportunities, uh, including the, the uh, two hour window they gave us to create a W collision which has been so much fun for me. I think some of the best shows we've ever done in AEW have been on collision. I think some of the best matches in AEW history and some of the best stories have happened there on collision and going from three hours a week to five hours a week, it's completely changed the company and we've grown so much. And, you know, the, in some of the very granular analysis that happens in pro wrestling uh, that's something that is uh, 
very big. And we see a lot, like I said, very granular analysis of data points week by week. But one of the biggest data points of all, and it's not just a week-to-week thing, it's week in, week out, is we've expanded from three hours a week to five hours a week. It's a big deal, and it's a big opportunity. And that is the most important growth. And we've been able to do it while sustaining the strength of the company and our pay-per-view business. And uh, we're continuing to hit new markets and find new ways uh, to new, deliver the show. I'm really excited about going down to the um, eSports Arena in Arlington for the Collision Summer Series on the path to All In. And I think that that opportunity for Collision and all these opportunities came thanks to Mr. Zasloff and Warner Brothers Discovery and the team there with Kathleen Finch, Bruce Campbell, Sam Linsky, Dan Fox, all the great people that give us these opportunities week in, week out, and the president of the network, Mr. Jason Sarlanis, who's a big fan of AEW and and, uh, very knowledgeable, and we're very fortunate to have a network president that knows that much about wrestling and cares that much about it. So uh, I'm really blessed to be on TBS and TNT. I'm not sure what's going to happen with some of the other sports there, but it's very exciting that we're getting into college football now. There's a lot of great sports on TBS and TNT now, in addition to AEW and and the wrestling we do, they've got, you know, March Madness, NHL, MLB baseball, and now college football and the NBA. And uh, I'm sure that however this ends up, that Mr. Zasloff will still have a very strong lineup of sports. And, uh, you know, I, I, I watching it with interested eyes as to what happens with all this stuff. Um, but I'm same as you. I mean, uh, you know, it's a little different for me because I work at TBS and TNT. So uh, maybe following it a little more closely than the average person. But I think all of you working in wrestling seem to be following it pretty closely, too. So I think we're all kind of uh, keeping an eye on it. But uh, for me, I'm I'm really happy to work here and very blessed. And every time I hear Tony Schiavone's voice on TBS and TNT, it puts a smile on my face, which means I, I get to smile a lot. Uh, and I work in the wrestling business, uh, which also puts a smile on my face. So uh, I, uh, I'm very blessed by it all. And, uh, you know, we're every day we get to spend here on TBS and TNT. It's a real blessing for us in AEW. Thank you, John. Tony, that's it. Do you have any uh, closing thoughts? Yeah, thanks, Jim. Uh, well, it's been five years, five great years. And I'm so excited for double or nothing. I can't wait to go back to the MGM Grand. It'll be surreal being back where it all started on our five-year anniversary weekend. And a lot of you on this call, this is not our first interaction over these five years. We've had a lot of great calls. Uh, some of you have asked tough questions. Some of you have asked great questions, fun, nice questions. But uh, through all the ups, downs, great shows, all the great events, we've had a, a really, really uh really really very i would like to say uh i i would say a strong uh i would say a uh a big turnout from a lot of you coming to the shows being at the scrums being on these calls we've had a lot of feedback a lot of questions um a lot of articles, a lot of stories. You guys have all written thousands and thousands of words about AEW over the last five years. And I really appreciate it. Even if I haven't always agreed with everything you've all said, I think that all of you putting in the time and effort to covering wrestling makes all of our jobs and all of our lives better. And I appreciate that all of you do it. I think it's awesome. You know, wrestling, my favorite thing. And uh, I really appreciate all the time you all put in on wrestling and especially on AEW. And thanks for doing it over these past five years. And hopefully we'll give you a great show on Sunday. And uh, then we can celebrate five more years and and many more after that. Thanks for uh, coming to this media call today. And if you didn't get your question answered, hopefully we'll be able to answer it on Sunday at the Scrum. And uh, with that, Jim and and Mandy and and everybody on uh, the AEW media team, I just wanted to thank all of you also. Uh, I try to thank the media at the end of these calls, but I also really appreciate all of you uh, for everything you've done for us over these uh, past 
five years. Uh, Jim and Mandy and a lot of the team here from the beginning. Adam came in and uh, joined us along the way, and uh, I think we got a great group here. And um, I'm very grateful to all of you, and thanks for a great five years.